Anna Whitelock, um, Royal Historian. We're here to talk about the documentary from Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, what it says, the fallout, what it means for the royal family. What are you going to tell me? I'm going to tell you that they were perhaps spot on in their questioning of the relationship between the monarchy and the media and also raising questions about the monarchy's place in a multi-faith, multi-ethnic society when essentially it's a white, privileged, white royal family. Anna Whitelock, you are a professor of the history of the monarchy at City University of London and the director of the Centre for the Study of Modern Monarchy. Firstly, before we talk about Meghan and Harry in this documentary, where did your interest in the monarchy come from? Well, I studied actually the Tudor monarchy, so really 500 years ago. But actually over time, I began to really understand, and as I was asked more and more to do media commentary, that actually to understand the modern monarchy, one needs to understand the monarchy as a historical institution. Um, and actually quite a lot of commentary on the monarchy is done uh, by journalists or biographers who don't actually have that long perspective on why we do the certain th things that we do. So actually understanding the modern monarchy through the lens of the past, I think, brings a really important perspective. And so does that mean from, from, from where you sit, your interest in um, this documentary and what it says, for you, is it just tabloid gossip, a family feud, or is it something much deeper which goes to the core of the royal family and its place within our society? I think it's both. I mean, it's a really good question. And actually, from the time of the Tudors, of course, the royal families um, was very much all about, you know, the monarchy. Certainly in the past, uh, the monarchy uh, was all important. Now, of course, less so. But I think the documentary, and certainly the first three episodes, really did ask questions about the monarchy's place in Britain today. How can the monarchy be relevant uh, in a progressive, multi-ethnic, multi-faith society? And also the role of the media. And so although some people dismiss those first three episodes as being relatively benign, actually, I think they did raise and ask really searching questions about the monarchy. Let's get into that now. And we're speaking ahead of the final three episodes. So we're going to touch upon those sort of broader talking points from the first three episodes. And also we've seen the trailer for the next three episodes. So we sort of get a sense of what's going to be talked about. And as you say, one of the big themes is really the role of the media and the way it interacts with the royal family. And indeed, in the trailer for the next set of episodes, Meghan Markle says, I wasn't being thrown to the wolves, I was being fed to the wolves. And Harry says, they were happy to lie to protect my brother. They were never willing to tell the truth to protect us. In the first three episodes, Harry and Meghan are making this argument that royal correspondents and the media are just the PR arm of the royal family. To what extent do you think that's true? I think to a large extent, it is true, but I think it's important to consider what we mean by the press and the media. So, of course, there's what's called the royal uh, roster, the royal rota, which are authorised journalists who follow the royals around, who go on royal tours and they're accredited and approved by the palace. Then there's, of course, the paparazzi who sort of just go after pictures in particular of um, the royals. And then there's, you know, there's journalists, there's biographers, there's observers, there's really anyone who has a view and has perhaps some kind of link with the royal family or those aristocratic circles, however tenuous, who sometimes also appears uh, doing commentary. So I think it varies. But it's certainly true that the media and the, the monarchy really since the 1950s have had this very tight uh, relationship. Um, absolutely necessary bedfellows. Uh, Prince uh, Philip understood that, you know, by bringing uh, the coronation to the masses when it was televised. Tens of thousands take up the cheering, cheers of loyalty, admiration and affection for our young and lovely queen on this, her day of death. In many ways, I think the media has stayed in that 1950s deferential mode when it talks about the monarchy. And certainly, you know, the main platforms, I think, have found it difficult to critically engage and analyse the monarchy in a way that I find really surprising. I mean, I would say that the royal brief and royal editors should have the same kind of questioning brief like diplomatic editors or political editors, but you rarely find that. So... 
I think Harry was making the point that there's a kind of an agenda that is essentially pushed by the palace. Um, and of course, that Harry and Meghan lost out because that agenda was not about protecting them. And instead, it was about protecting perhaps William as a member of the royal family and, of course, ultimately an heir. What extent do you think that the public actually knows about that relationship? You know, David Dimbleby was writing about this exact issue and saying that Buckingham Palace can exert a lot of control over the BBC. He was talking about, you know, during the broadcast of the Queen's funeral, he was talking about how emails would arrive from palace officials dictating which clips of footage could be shown in the broadcast. Do you think the public understands that, in, in many ways, you know, that sounds like a bizarre thing, that the palace can control exactly the types of images that we were seeing during, you know, those days of mourning? I don't think the public do understand that. And I think I'm always surprised at how that sort of editing and that control and that directing in real time can happen from the palace. But of course, also the, the constant kind of relationship that has to be managed between uh, the main broadcasters and the palace, a wish not to offend them, uh, question them, challenge them, because otherwise, you know, they may not be included uh, in, a, in future royal broadcasts and so on. And I think in a way there's a hesitancy from the broadcasters to go, actually, this is crazy. You know, we're now in the 21st century. You know, we should be asking questions about why they're going on this royal tour. At what cost? For whose benefit? Is it the fear of not being able to have any access to it? Or is it, or is it going back to a sort of some sort of British innate different deferential sort of feelings towards the monarchy that you don't offend? I think it's a really interesting question. I mean, I think there is the question of access and the monarchy, uh, you know, control access to them. And there's a sense that the broadcasters, uh, you know, particularly don't want to be out of the loop and, you know, don't want to lose uh, access to for potential programming and so on. But I think there seems to be, you know, with the mainstream media, a sense of, of still this sort of deference, this lack of... Uh, this lack of questioning. I do think the death of the Queen has opened up a possibility that that might be more the case going forward. But I think, in a way, it's who's going to break cover first. Which of the broadcasters are just going to go, actually, maybe we're not going to report in this in quite the same way. I think the Harry and Meghan thing, in many ways, is a distraction from that because I think that has particularly polarised you know, public opinion and this sort of battle between those that left the monarchy, Harry and Meghan, and the monarchy. I guess it's an interesting point because if Harry and Meghan's um, sort of modus operandi is to try and allow more nuance within the reporting of the royal family and to allow more criticism. What you're saying there is that actually this documentary might be a distraction away from all of that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's hard to know exactly whether they have a motivation in that sense, whether they're looking to reform the monarchy and the royal family or instead whether they're simply trying to tell their truth um, and in a sense put a very different perspective into the media and into the public narrative than has been the case so far and particularly of course this claim that conscious or unconscious bias racism has been uh, leveled at Meghan when she joined the family and played a role in pushing them out of the family um, and so I do think they want to tell their story whether they're looking to you know reform and believe there's going to be change I'm not sure and of course there is also the motivation of money and you know that doesn't mean that what they say isn't true mm. uh, in part but there's also a commercial aspect here too looking at the, the the general response to the first three episodes from the British media in the main it has been derisive towards the documentary does that not in many ways prove their point I mean Buckingham Palace hasn't given us an official response to it, but arguably they don't need to because, because of that relationship with the media, because they know that they have certain correspondents and reporters who are deferential and favourable, we've already seen an outpouring of attack on the documentary without them even uttering a word. I think that is true. I think there's been a sort of, if not an attack on the documentary, kind of dismissing it. And I think in a way that proves my point. I mean, I've seen lots of commentators in the media saying well actually you know the palace must be quite relaxed after this you know they might have been expecting real and targeted challenge in those first three episodes and really it was just about the love story of Harry and Meghan and didn't seem to get the fact that in talking about the media and in talking about unconscious bias within the royal family and more broadly you know the notion of this racist institution uh, 
uh, perhaps, or at least an institution that is about white inherited privilege, that that is so at odds with a multi-ethnic society. From my understanding of reading it, you know, if you go back to sort of the 1820s, the press was very critical of the monarchy, especially at a time when, you know, George III could still, you know, oust governments, you know, Queen Victoria basically got Lord Palmerston kicked out of the Foreign Office. There was a time when the monarchy had a bit more political power. It had a lot of vitriol from the press, didn't it? When did we see that shift? I think from Queen Victoria's reign, when we saw the move away from the monarchy having real political influence or political power, to being much more about ceremonial uh, influence and being a ceremonial figurehead and all being about philanthropy, good causes, charitable works. And in that sense, the monarchy needed the media. I mean, as, as the late Queen said, you need to be seen to be believed. And so the media was absolutely necessary to the monarchy. And in return, um, the monarchy would give the media access. And of course, you know, even now, the big set piece events, royal weddings and so on, are huge television um, events all watched now, not just nationally, but all around the world. And, and they are very modern in many ways, because a lot of the, the things which we think of as tradition, the lying in state of the Queen, that in Westminster Hall is only 100 years old. I think we forget that, that you know, we are brought up in this idea that it's all ancient customs. Actually, it's only 100 years exactly. old and it's tied to this sort of sense of a monarchy which brings us together at a time when it has no real political power. Absolutely that. Um, Walter Badgett, who was writing in the 19th century, a kind of Victorian journalist and observer of monarchy and the constitution, sort of described how, in a way, once the monarchy lost its political power, it became this thing that would bind the nation together, the sort of national figure. And it was the importance of, you know, flipperies like royal weddings and other events that bound the nation. And the pinnacle of that is, is presumably the death of the Queen and the, the Ten Days of Mourning. Is that where we saw the royal family and its ability to manoeuvre the narrative, the Ten Days of Pictures? at its epoch, in a way. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And also, I mean, in the on the uh, monarchy's website, in the last few years of the Queen's reign, we saw this move, not only the Queen being described as head of state, but also head of nation, and this sort of national figure, which, yes, I mean, in the death of the Queen, we saw the power of the monarchy, the power of the monarchy in terms of symbolism, but also the role of the royal family to sort of bolster and make human and make real and sort of emote in that institution of the monarchy. Is that why, presumably then, you know, going back to the documentary, it's so frightening for the royal family? Because it's Meghan and Harry saying, look, this is all invented tradition, you know, this is all them using their, you know, their PR arm in the media. Um, and we are in ourselves quite political beings and we're questioning everything. Harry and Meghan's documentary, I think, can be dismissed by the royals, although we're yet to see exactly how far their challenge goes in the second half of the, the next three episodes. But I think it would be silly for them to dismiss it and they would dismiss it at their peril because... Although, yes, it's, it's dressed up in a kind of family story of Harry and Meghan and their love story, there really is significant challenges which the monarchy and the royal family can't get away from. And I think Charles and William are very alive to that. They know that clearly women marrying into the royal family historically have had a very difficult time. They know, for whatever reason, Meghan did not feel welcome and accepted in the royal family and decided that actually the only way was out. They know that they are this white family in a, in a, in a society that is now very, very different, that is multi-faith, multi-ethnic. They know that the royal family, the monarchy, are, uh, you know, is built to large part on you know, colonialism. All of those legacies, all of those challenges are enshrined and embodied by the monarchy and the royal family. And so... That's why I think Harry and Meghan, the, the questions that they raise and the implications of what they're saying 
are much more problematic for the royal family than particular charges they might make about individuals or the media. It's that wider questioning of the place of the monarchy in 21st century society, a debate that's been held in check for the last you know, few decades because of respect for the Queen and the sense that her reign wasn't going to last forever. You know, Harry and Meghan in, in the first set of episodes argue that the royal family questioned why Meghan should be protected following racist headlines and stalking by the paparazzi after news of their relationship broke out in 2016. Instead, they say the advice from the palace was, don't say anything. Just going back to when we saw the marriage of Meghan and Harry in 2018, to where we are now, at the time, it did feel like there was a celebration of a person of colour marrying into the family. Do you, do you think that was a genuine positive feeling at the time, or was there always an undercurrent that it could go wrong? I think there was a sense of opportunity and celebration, but yes, I think at the same time there was an undercurrent that it could go wrong. I think in part, though, that was because there was this American woman uh, who was much older than the typical uh, royal bride who hadn't been around the royal family for a long time. Of course, you know, Kate had been... Um, with William for many, many years before they married. And so I think not necessarily uh, race would have been the overriding thing. Although, of course, you know, I'm saying that as a white woman. And certainly I think, you know, I would not want to suggest that Meghan didn't experience uh, the treatment of her as racism. Um, and of course, we saw just recently the comments made by Lady Susan Hussey, one of uh, the late Queen's uh, women of the bedchamber, one of her closest companions, asking, you know, with great persistence and great ignorance questions about where um, the charity worker who was attending um, the function that was at the palace came from. And I think this does point to, and Harry himself described it in the um, documentary, at the very least an unconscious bias. They've grown up in a world of white privilege, and of course, you know, race hasn't been part of their world particularly. And so I think, you know, he's saying once you see that, you know, as he has, it's his duty um, and his obligation to actually call it out. Lady Hussey was also actually the aide who the Queen sent to brief Meghan when she first joined the royal family. If you talk about that unconscious bias and whether the royal family wants to address it, if you go from the Oprah interview where they make the, the accusation that someone from the family had, set, had questioned what colour skin their first child would um, have. And the fact that the response then from Buckingham Palace was, um, you know, recollections may vary. To then going to the, what happened with um, Lady Hussey and what she said, does that show a change then? That the royal family has, has moved from that period where it goes, we don't talk about private matters, let's stay away from it, to actually addressing this and saying, well, that was clear racism. I think, yes, it does show a change. And, of course, it was the Queen who said recollections may vary. And now, of course, King Charles on the throne, he and William, I think, made clear very quickly uh, that Lady Hussey's position was untenable. And, yes, she stepped down. Um, so I think this does show, uh, perhaps, an awareness of the need to act quickly. Um, and that, you know, saying nothing, as, you know, the Queen never explain, never complain. That was her motto. That's not good enough now. And I think, you know, they will be very, very aware of the challenge that Harry and Meghan pose for them in terms of, of race. And I think they will do all they can to try and address it. However, whatever William and Charles may do, there is undoubtedly a whole, you know, firm the, the royal family writ large, the palace, all those officials who perhaps have very, very different understandings of race. And mm. arguably, you know, perhaps as some would suggest, there needs to be a real clear out and real understanding within the palace of what equality and inclusivity really looks like. Is that happening? I don't think there's any direct sign of it. The palace have said that people all, you know, all those working in the palace have EDI training. But of course, there's people like the Lady Susan Husses of this world who are there not with a now official appointment, but they're because they're members, friends, close to the, the royal family. And I think, you know, the palace are going to have to do more. I, I know the... Um, the Dutch royal family, I think, have commissioned an, uh, some research into colonialism and their, the sort of links between um, the monarchy and colonialism. And you could say, well, would that be a thing that the British monarchy could do to show that they're leaning in, as it were, and engaging with this? Does that response to 
the Lady Hussey incident, does that show a willingness to sort of move with the times? You know, I know that King Charles has previously, you know, spoken about slavery. You know, he was there when um, Barbados uh, gained its independence. Does that show a, a possible move that actually, whatever ha happens in the next few episodes, they can't just ignore things? I think they will try to say something in their own time, in their own way, and they won't want to say something off the back of the next three episodes of the documentary. If there was something particularly egregious against an individual that they could absolutely dispute, then possibly. But I think they will do all they can not to say anything, but instead, you know, to absorb the message and then try and act in their own way. I think in relation to um, the countries of the Caribbean, yes, uh, Prince Charles was there when uh, Barbados became a republic. Speaking after his mother, the Queen, was removed as head of state, Prince Charles focused on the enduring friendship between Barbados and the UK, but he also touched on the painful history. From the darkest days of our past and the appalling atrocity of slavery, which forever stains our history, the people of this island forged their path with extraordinary fortitude. And I think quite reasonably, actually, as his father had said way before uh, on a trip to Canada, you know, if these countries want to become republics and go their own way, um, that's fine. And as Prince William said on his recent tour of the Caribbean, you know, relationships change, friendships endure. And I think they understand that. But it's also true um, that, you know, talking to people in the Caribbean or here, the Queen's failure to speak out at the time of the Windrush scandal, mm. when there was a Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, when in fact the main focus of it was the Queen expressing her wish that Charles um, succeed her as head of the Commonwealth. That's not a direct inherited position. Um, and that was the main focus, not speaking about the Windrush scandal. Now, in her defence, people could say, yes, but that would be involving herself in UK politics. But certainly many people felt that as queen in a whole range of Caribbean countries, she really should have said something. David Olashogu, the, the historian in the documentary, does make that point that, you know, I was only ever taught at school about the abolition of slavery in 1807. And that does often happen when you talk about uh, Britain and its, it, it, its empire. We say, well, we were the first country to abolish slavery. We gave everyone in independence. We gave them railroads. We gave them parli parliaments, etc. To what extent do you think that actually goes to something much deeper? I think we have a very partial, limited, uh, you know, in a sense, inaccurate view of our national story, of British history. The, you know, what's taught, what's not taught is, I mean, it's scandalous, really. And then, of course, some people would say when, you know, they challenge that, would say, oh, this is just the woke agenda. Mm. Um, and certainly, you know, if you have a view of history as has been traditionally taught in schools, then it's fine, the monarchy. I mean, they're just, they're there uh, as a kind of, you know, act of history. They're in many ways privileged, um, but at the same time, you know, the gilded cage, poor them. You know, they have a life that many people wouldn't want. And so in terms of that future definition of what the monarchy will be under King Charles, how important do you think the coronation is to setting the tone for that future? I don't think the coronation is particularly important. I mean, it's an important moment and it's the start of the official start of the reign and it's, it will be a, a set piece in history which people will look back on. And there's no doubt that certain changes will be made. It will be shorter uh, to reflect the fact that people haven't got the appetite for hours and hours of a long ceremony. Um, it will have a more multi-faith, multi-ethnic representation there in the congregation. That said, the fundamentals will be unchanged. The, the, the oaths uh, to uphold the Church of England, the anointing, all of these things which are absolutely fundamental to what the monarchy is today. And I guess an important thing about the coronation is how the media will reflect on that, report on it and define that narrative. Yeah, I mean, I think it will be very interesting, but I suspect it will be quite predictable and it won't change very much. I suspect, you know, certain broadcasters, it will be the very sombre, staid tones um, that describe what's happening in the sort of very weighty historical moment. Um, I doubt that very many broadcasters will 
ask questions and critique it, at perhaps for its cost or what it represents or doesn't represent. Do you think the problem, though, you know, thinking about what we've spoken about is more with the royal family or with the media? I do think the media do need to kind of look at themselves uh, and question what their purpose in reporting the royals is. And I think, you know, don't get me wrong, there's some excellent royal journalists um, Absolutely. Um, there's also some, you know, commentators that I don't feel have much particular depth in terms of their analysis. But it's absolutely true that overall um, the media, I think, has modernised actually far less than the monarchy since the 1950s. They're stuck in this deferential mode, waiting to be sort of thrown tidbits of access uh, by the palace. How pivotal a moment is this for the royal family uh, going forward? The first three episodes the next three episodes, and then also Prince Harry's book, Spare, which is coming out next year. I think only time will tell. I mean, the monarchy, you know, has endured all kinds of crises over the centuries. And it may be that in, you know, a decade to come, half a century to come, this will just be another wayward son um, talking about uh, his issues with the royal family. Or it might be that it is another kind of pebble in the pool of wider circles of discussion and discontent about what exactly the monarchy is for, what it's doing, what its place and purpose is. Um, I think, I suspect it will be more the former. I think the monarchy will, over time, you know, sort of, this will be buffeted away. Um, but I think the pressure really is ultimately on the future reign of King William. I think people have a sense that Charles is in a sort of holding position. Uh, the most he can expect is kind of apathy from the public. He doesn't represent newness, freshness, modernity. And therefore, I think people will, the last chance perhaps will be King William, whether he can somehow redefine the monarchy for a modern age. And that's the big question. Anna Whitelock, thank you very much for talking to me. Thank you very much.